in September of 1990, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Blossom, and Wings all premiered on network television. Memphis Belle, Goodfellows, and Postcards from the Edge were released in theaters. The top three songs were Release Me by Wilson Phillips, Blaze of Glory by Bon Jovi, and Close to You by Maxi Priest, who could forget them. Sidney Sheldon's Memories of Midnight was on top of the New York Times bestseller list. And these things had not been invented or created the Sony PlayStation, the World Wide Web, Facebook, text messaging, Google, Amazon, Netflix, smartphones, flat screen high definition television sets, the Carolina Panthers, and in September of 1990, my family and I were called to Sunset Road Baptist Church. 31 years. That's a long time. And here it is, September the 5th, 2021. Exactly three months from today, December the 5th, I will retire as your pastor. And the special relationship that we've had for all of these years will be changed. You know, there are few relationships quite like the relationship that exists between a pastor and a church. You have opened up your lives to me. You've allowed me to minister in some of the most significant occasions in your life. Weddings, the births of children, graduation, the death of loved ones. You've invited me into your homes where we've shared tears and laughter and lots of good times. You've entrusted me to rightly to stand in this pulpit and rightly divide the word of God's truth. You've allowed my family to be themselves and treated them and received them as members of your own family. It's been a good run. And while I'm excited about the idea of being retired and seeing what God is going to do in the future with Sunset Road Baptist Church, the old song is proving true. Breaking up is hard to do. It's hard for Pam and me, and from what many of you have told me, it's hard for you too which is the point of this morning's sermon. I want to share some ideas that will help us create a healthy new relationship in the future. Let me tell you about one of the worst days of my life. It happened in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. Before we had even left for our mission trip, I was already a basket case. I would realized that I had lapsed into one of my periodic uh, struggles with depression. I probably shouldn't even have gone in the first place. But then about three days into the work, I woke up one morning with a fierce migraine. I was throwing up. I was unable to lift my head off the pillow. But there was work to be done at the small village church that we were helping. So everyone else had to go out to the work site while I stayed behind at the hotel. Did I mention that this hotel was probably the seediest place I've ever stayed in my life? I didn't even feel comfortable lying in the bed, let alone facing a long day by myself. Let me tell you, I have never felt so all alone in all of my years of life. I was a long way from home. I was away from everyone that I knew, that I loved, and who loved me. I felt like the rest of the team had abandoned me. It wasn't true, but that's the way I felt. I was miserably depressed. I was violently sick, and I was fiercely angry. Maybe you've wrestled with some of those feelings as we approach this pastoral transition. Maybe not the physically sick part, but angry because you feel like Steve is abandoning me. After all, you have supported and encouraged me all of these years, and now I'm getting ready to leave you. It's... it's I, it's like a covenant of trust is being broken. I've been here for you, Steve. You were supposed to be here for me. Trust me. I understand some of what you're feeling because sometimes I feel like I'm abandoning you. Over the years, you have entrusted me with some of your deepest confidences. 
Your expectation has been that when you go to the hospital, when you get sick, that I'll come and pray for you and visit with you. Maybe you've assumed that I will do your funeral or conduct a wedding of your own wedding or somebody else's wedding. Maybe the fact that I've been here for 31 years has given you a sense of comfort as you come to worship here at Sunset Road. Look, you have given me one of the highest honors of my life. You have called me your pastor. We've shared a koinonia life of fellowship together, which I will treasure until my dying day and until and into eternity. But believe me, me when I say this, I did not come to this decision lightly or carelessly. It's been bathed in prayer and Bible study and thoughtful meditation. In Proverbs 14, 16, 4, the Bible says, the Lord works everything out to its proper end. The point is, I believe that this is God's time. I believe that God called me to Sunset Road in September of 1990, and, it's, and I believe that it's His plan to have me turn over the reins of this church to a new pastor after December the 5th. By the way, let me encourage you to trust your next pastor the way you've always trusted me. Now, we're going to talk about this more in October, but you've got to take that risk of trust. He won't be like me, but that'll be okay. He'll be the person God has called you to be your pastor, and that's what really counts. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm 23, we're going to read the entire psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A few weeks ago, I started making some plans for the special Thanksgiving and Christmas worship services that we have here at the church. When I came to the Christmas Eve service, I got a little teary-eyed. I mean... The Christmas Eve service will be one of the first major worship events that we have after my retirement, and I am going to miss it. In fact, I don't know how it's going to feel like Christmas if I'm not with all of you. I, I, I gotta be, I, I've been feeling these kinds of things for quite some time now. We'll have an event at church, and I'll get a little wistful. That was my last Easter worship service here at Sunset Road. That was my last vacation Bible school as a pastor. That was my last back-to-school bash. That was my last Christmas in August campaign. Maybe you've been having similar thoughts since I announced my retirement in January. And let me just tell you this, that is all perfectly normal. It's part of a process called grief. I used to say that grief is the high price that you pay for loving someone, and that that is certainly true in this case. But there's more to grief than that. Grief is a God-given emotion that lets you deal with feelings of loss and dislocation. Grief is what gives you time to think through and sort through all the the, the torments of, the torrents of, of fear, and dreams, and joys, and memories. Healthy grief is ultimately what allows you to emerge into a new normal with a faith that is firmly grounded in Christ Jesus our Lord. The point that I'm making is that you and I will experience moments of grief over the next three months. Don't be surprised by them. Don't try to ignore them. Instead, embrace them and receive the full measure of God's blessing and grace. But having said all of that, 
Please do not treat this transition time like a death. I will no longer be your pastor. Pam and I will no longer be able to attend worship here, at least you know, for the foreseeable future. But we're not going anyplace unless God has plans for us that He has not yet revealed. Pam and I will still live 11 miles away in Highland Creek. We'll still have the same telephone numbers. We'll still be shopping and eating at all the old haunts, assuming COVID lets up. And we'll still see you here at Sunset Road on occasion for weddings, for funerals, and other events. And, and also remember this, Matthew, Rebecca, Vivian, Zeke, and Allie Mike will still be members here. They'll still serve God in this place. And you know, when, when the kids have a special event at the church, we'll be like all the other grandparents, proudly showing up to support and encourage them. Look, there's no doubt that our new relationship is going to be different. But that doesn't mean it's going to be better, and it doesn't mean it's going to be worse. It'll just be different. And you know what? That's all okay. For instance, you should know that Pam and I still want you to give us a phone call when you need to chat about something, when you want to chat about something, and our home is always open to you. The only rule will be, don't tell us about all the behind-the-scenes stuff going on at the church. Don't call to complain about your new pastor. Those are things that we cannot and we will not talk about. On the other hand, if your child is getting baptized or graduating from high school or college, if there's about to be a wedding in your family, if you've just found out you're going to be a grandparent, if you want us to pray with you about something, you'd better let us know. In the words of Lionel Richie, we want to share your party with you. Let's turn now to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You know, we have had a great run for 31 years. We've accomplished a lot, and we've made it through some hard times and some challenging times. I was thinking just the other day, you know, next weekend is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. When I came, became your pastor, the terrorist attacks on America were still 11 years in the future. And now we're looking back 20 years at that same event. We've made it through times like this. We've made it through paying off the building over there. We've made it through COVID, even though that's still an ongoing battle. But as the end of my tenure draws to a close, I don't want you to baptize the last three decades in a pool of nostalgia. Nostalgia is what happens when you start to think of the past as some sort of golden era, a time when everything was better than it is now, a time when problems were always resolved in a spirit of Christian unity and cooperation, a time when spiritual giants and heroes walked the earth, Nostalgia can be a lot of fun, but it can also cloud your vision for the future. Look, when you think about my time here as your pastor, be realistic. Give God credit for all the good things that have happened and be feel, feel free to give me all the blame for the bad things that went on. But let me tell you something. The best days of Sunset Road Baptist Church will not end with my retirement. With God, the best is always yet to come because He has a plan and a purpose for the spiritual family of Sunset Road Baptist Church. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Bible says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Listen to me. This verse of Scripture, I know I have the I know the plans I have for you. You have got to believe this. You've got to have faith that God is going to make this happen. God made the whole of creation in 6 days. 
You don't think he can have, handle something as simple as seeing a church through a period of pastoral transition? Come on, give God something hard to do. Besides that, God knows something that we sometimes forget. Sunset Road is not going to become leaderless with my retirement because the leader of this church is, was, and always will be the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church. Now, I will be honest. This fact can sometimes bump up against the temptation to sort of withdraw for a while and see how things sort themselves out. Look, the tendency to do that is perfectly normal. The desire to do that can be perfectly normal. But trust me, God needs you, Jesus needs you, the church family needs you right here, right now, maybe more than ever before. If you have your Bible still, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read verses 7 through 11. Listen to what God's Word says in this place. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He distributes them to each one just as He determines. You have been given a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, a spiritual gift is something that goes beyond your natural talents and abilities. A spiritual gift is something that God gives you to help the church accomplish its mission and ministry in the world. Remember, the mission and ministry of Sunset Road is not going to end when I walk out the door. The responsibility for the church to do missions, ministry, and evangelism will remain the same, and it's not going to wait on the new pastor to arrive. You will be asked to use your talents, your abilities, and your God-given gifts to exalt the name of Jesus, to build up the people of God, and to reach our community with the good news of God's grace. Let's say, for instance, that you really enjoy the annual Easter sunrise worship. It's my favorite worship of the year, but let's say that you really like it as much as I do. Now, hopefully, your next pastor will be here long before the 17th of April. But in the event that doesn't happen, a lot of work goes into preparing the sunrise worship. Now, obviously, Jason and Matthew will still be here, but remember, these, these two men have outside jobs. They have families that require uh, a lot of their time. Someone is going to have to step up and help plan that worship. Christmas Eve is the same thing. Because if no one does, there will not be an Easter sunrise worship here at Sunset Road next year. Now, it's easy to sit back and assume, well, someone's going to do it but there are no guarantees. Instead, someone has to hold up their hand like Isaiah did and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Please, 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 please be that person. I hope you'll remember my time here with you warmly and fondly and joyously. I like the way Dr. Seuss puts it. He said, don't be sad it's over, be glad it happened. And by all means, don't let your love for Pam and me cloud your vision of the future God is planning for you. Step up and be a part of the new thing God is going to do here in this sacred and holy place. All right, if you still have your Bibles, let's turn to 
Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through 38. Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through 38. This passage of Scripture describes Paul's final encounter with the elders in the church at Ephesus. Look at what the Bible tells us about that event. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and he kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. You know, what we're going through, my my retirement, this transition to a new pastor, it's tough for you and it's tough for Pam and me. But it is nothing compared to what Paul and the Ephesian elders were experiencing on that day. The fact is, you and I will be seeing one another from time to time. These men knew that they would never again see one another. This was their last goodbye. This was the end, the final curtain. Except it wasn't. And Paul and the Ephesian elders knew that it wasn't. Now, they would never again see one another in this life. But they knew what the future held in store for them. Paul had that future in mind when he wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Okay, how's this for encouragement? Someday, you and I are going to spend eternity together in the presence of Jesus. Think about this. For the last 31 years, you have sat under my preaching and listened to me as I have tried to rightly divide the Word of God. But in the future, you and I are going to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to Him as He perfectly shares the truth of God. In our time together, we have tried to worship God in spirit and in truth. In the future, we're going to be ushered into the throne room of heaven as we worship God in the presence of angels. In Isaiah 6, 1 through 4, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Can you imagine seeing such a thing? Wouldn't that be amazing? 
For the last 31 years, I have tried you to, to help you understand what Jesus did when He died for your, you and your sin on the cross of Calvary. In the future, you and I are going to bow down at Jesus' feet and join with the heavenly chorus in proclaiming Jesus is worthy. Revelation 5, 11 through 13. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that, that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That is what we have in store for us. That's what we have to look forward to. Eternity together in the presence of Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship that we've experienced this morning. We thank you for watching over us as we have tried to sing your praise. As we have voiced our words of praise. As we have prayed together. As we have read your scripture together. And as we have listened to your word proclaimed for this hour. And now, Father, we come to the time of invitation. And if there's someone here today who has never asked Jesus to be their personal Savior and Lord, whether this person is here in the sanctuary or watching online, I pray that you, you have been speaking to them today and reminded them that you love them, that Jesus died for them, and that anyone who calls in the name of Jesus will be saved. And Father, I pray that today they're ready to receive Christ as their Savior by praying this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. You died because I'm a sinner. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you were physically raised from the dead three days after your death on the cross. Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I invite you to come into my life and be my Savior and forever friend. Father, if someone has prayed this prayer, if they're here in the worship center this morning, I pray that they'll come forward when the invitation is given and let all of us know what's happened to them. And, and by coming saying, I want to follow Jesus in believer's baptism. Others who've been watching online may want to send me a text message at the address shown on the screen, an email. And just, just let me know what's happened so we can talk and chat some more about this. Father, there may be others who want to come and, and join our church by a transfer of letter, by statement. Father, there may be others who want to come to the altar and pray. I know the, that the pastor search committee would love to see people coming forward and praying with them as they seek out the next pastor of this church. Father, whatever decision needs to be made, we're going to sing Because He Lives as a song of of celebration and praise. And Father, I pray that it will be a time of response as well. And we ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen.